All righty, good morning, y'all. Good morning, and uh, welcome to Bedford Acres. We're excited that you're here this morning. There we go. I'm excited that you're here this morning. Would you stand together? We're going to sing, I Thank God. Lord, a shout of praise this morning. All right. Go ahead and say hey to your neighbor as we greet each other this morning. I know, it's okay. Morning, Martell. It's good to see you. Give you a hug. Okay. Good morning and welcome to Bedford Acres Christian Church. Um, my name is Carl Wilby and uh, I work with your students here. Uh, we had a great time at the rodeo. Thank you for all those people that helped us get there. We really appreciate it. <clears throat> Please do not forget that we are collecting coats and scarves and mittens and hats and all that kind of stuff to do a coat uh, distribution to the homeless people in Lexington. So if you have any of those in your closet, uh, we could use some help. 
Some other announcements. If you're our first time guest, we are so glad you're here. Stop by the Welcome Center uh, and find out more information about our church. There's a first time gift also there. Be sure to let us know you're here by filling out one of those great cards in front of you or the church app. While you're check checking in, please silence your cell phone. Community Christmas concert here at uh, uh, BACC, the Rotary Club, will be having their Christmas concert here uh, the evening after Thanksgiving weekend at 6.30. At 6.30, American Heritage Girls will be providing refreshments. There's a congregational business meeting right after church service on Sunday, December 8th. We'll be voting on elder board members and the budget, and the copies of the budget are available at the Welcome Center. Uh, today is our church Thanksgiving dinner. We will be feasting here at the Fellowship Hall at 5 o'clock. Uh, if you volunteered to help in the kitchen, please arrive at 4. Now, this year has been the year of the pig, if you have not been keeping up on the news. And no, that has nothing to do with politics. Um, the, if you've really seen Carla, Carla, uh, she has a, a lot of experience. Um, she had pigs when she was little. How many of y'all had pigs when you were little? Yeah. Okay. And, or used those. And, and pigs are a really, really... Um, big, big escape artists. Do we all know that, right? They're, they can get out of anything. Uh, one time, Carla, she uh, had to chase one all the way here into Paris. It was, it was terrible, terrible. But as you've seen uh, on the news, I've been fascinated by the pigs this year. There was a, a pig in Louisville that got out and roamed around. And then in October, there were two pigs, no, three pigs that got out in um, I forgot the city. It'll come to me in a minute. But they escaped. Did you all see this? They escaped. Three pigs escaped, and they couldn't find them, and they were, went down to the ice cream parlor to get ice cream because apparently they had done it before. And this week is my favorite. If you haven't seen it, if you're looking for a good entertainment thing, I'm not lying. So Tacoma, Washington, the notorious P.I.G., that's what they call him, the notorious P.I.G. escaped in Tacoma, Washington this week, and it took the whole uh, police department to catch him, and they have body cams. It is great entertainment. So uh, if you are looking for a little laugh, some good entertainment, I really recommend it. We are really, really glad that you're here. So we got you thinking about the pigs. We're going to pray a little bit. Here we go. Father God, uh, we just thank you for the ability to be here and the time to worship. We just thank you for our congregation and we thank you for our worship team. God, we just ask that you be with us, that we really dial into you and really, really focus on you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. All right, we're going to stand together and worship some more. And I want to introduce the youth band up here this morning. They're going to be leading us in worship. So super excited for that. So let's stand together and sing Raise a Hallelujah.
and then there was one. <laughs> Let's continue with our praise and worship this morning by singing gratitude.
Good morning. Psalm 104 says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. You can see in that song that thanksgiving leads to compulsory praise. We're currently in a season that, as Americans, we call Thanksgiving. All this week, we'll be feasting and celebrating with friends um, of all the great things that God has given us. But as Christians, we are called to walk in a state of thanksgiving every day of our lives. We're to praise his name and to worship him. As followers of Jesus, he wants us to have a heart that is completely, 100% yielded to him. And thanksgiving is how we come to that point. This morning and every Sunday morning, we're invited to a better feast than any Thanksgiving meal that you're going to have this week. It's called communion. The great thing is for me that we don't have to cook anything to do it. We just come to that table and pull up a chair, and he invites us to a feast, to feast on him, to gain knowledge from his word, to let him pour into our hearts everything that we need to serve him, to love other people like he loves other people, to be kind and generous and faithful and patient and full of joy and full of love, to have lots of self-control. Sound familiar? That's what Paul said in Galatians. I invite you this morning as we take communion, I'm going to pray first. And then I want you to take your Thanksgiving meal, your real Thanksgiving meal for this week, and to hold it for just a few moments. And ask Jesus as we sit in quietness to clean your heart and your mind and to fill you with so much Thanksgiving that it is bursting forth from you to be thankful for all the things that God's given you, the beautiful things and the heartbreaking things that he has helped you to live through. Thanksgiving, that's what Thanksgiving with Jesus is all about. So we're going to pray, and then we're going to sit just a few moments in silence before we take up offering. Don't take this till you completely understand what you're doing. How thankful and grateful that this little meal is sustenance for your life. That without Jesus, there is no thanksgiving in your future. Let's pray. Jesus, we come before you today with grateful hearts. I pray that as we celebrate this week, that you would be the master and host of every feast represented here, beginning with the one tonight at church. You love a thankful heart, not just for one month of the year, but for every day of the year. In return, we'll praise and worship you. Thank you for your body and your blood that feeds us and nourishes us as a symbol, not just this little grape juice and this little wafer of bread but to feast on you. Help us to clear our mind and be so aware, so aware that only you give thankful hearts. It's in your holy name I pray.
as we come to the point of offering in our service. Giving also comes from a grateful heart, from a thankful heart. It's our representation of how we tell God thank you. It's how we trust him with everything that he gives us. As you give this morning, be thankful that you can do it. Be so grateful whether you have $1 or $100,000 to put in the offering this morning that you were able to bring that to him as a gift of thanksgiving. Let's pray. God, bless our tithes and offerings this morning. I pray that um, we would have cheerful giving hearts. Your word says you love a cheerful heart, God, that gives. And not from the abundance of what we have, but from our poverty. God, help us to give it all to you, whether it be monetary, what we're putting in the offering plate, or to lay down our lives for you as a living sacrifice this morning. We pray you would bless these tithes and offerings once again. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated. The breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. There at the cross, you paid the debt I owed, broke my chains, freed my soul, For the first time I had hope, thank you, Jesus, for the blood of light. Thank you, Jesus, you have washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life, brought me free. to glory. 
Good morning, everybody. Glad y'all are here this morning. Can we get the lights up just a little bit more? Can we just thank um, the youth band again for that? That was that was awesome. And uh, I want to say thank you to our regular worship team as well, um, and also to Mardell, because I hate to leave her alone up there, but she did a great job, so can we thank her as well? <laughs> this morning, um, as you can see, are the lights just broke or something? Okay, sorry. All right, um, <laughs> it's all right. As you can see, um, this picture is just strikes a lot of emotion if you were to see it. Probably think like, all right, what is happening here? Um, and I needed to address something this morning that we as a nation are, are divided and we have a lot of division going on. Um, and it's not just because it's based on politics or based on election or anything like that. Um, but I, I felt like I needed to bring it up because it's very important this morning. Um, some people, if we go to this next slide, are deciding to put up Christmas decorations before Thanksgiving. All right, I want to see a show of hands this morning. If you are like Christmas all the way, I don't care what day it is, raise your hand right now. All right, the rest of us, we're going to boo them right now. Boo! All right, who is like after Thanksgiving, like you have to wait? All right, there you go. Here's some sane people in the audience right here. All right, <laughs> just to get, there you go. I know, booze everywhere. That was kind of a, not a heated discussion in our uh, young adult Bible study this week, but we had some talks about that. Um, you know who you are if you, yeah, Shelby. <laughs> uh huh. Um, but this morning we're going to talk about gratitude as the communion meditation was very similar um, to what the Lord has for us this morning. And if we go to the next slide, we, we're we celebrating Thanksgiving this year, and y'all know this story, and you see little kindergartners every year dress up, and you got their little Indian outfits, and you got, you know, I'm a pilgrim, Mom. Oh, oh that's great, son. Okay, cool. You know, we kind of get used to the story of um, Thanksgiving and how um, people came across on the Mayflower how many of you have been to the Mayflower Rock, Plymouth Rock in Massachusetts? Wasn't that underwhelming? You know, it's just like a rock. They just put the 1620 on it. You know, you're excited. You're like, oh, we get to see Plymouth Rock this morning. You're like, all right. <laughs> it's kind of like Charlie Brown. It's like, oh, I got this for Christmas. I got this for Christmas. What do you get, Charlie Brown? A rock. <laughs> you know, it's just kind of like underwhelming. Um, but when you think about it, these people were very brave to go across the ocean and just like a bunch of wood put together in a boat. I won't even like barely call it a boat. Um, they had to go through a very difficult winter um, and barely survive based on what they could grow and based on what they could hunt. Um, but this is why we celebrate Thanksgiving this morning, not this morning, but later on. Um, and I want us to recognize that Thanksgiving is not just something um, that the pilgrims and the Indians celebrated together, um, but it's actually a biblical principle, much like we talked like earlier. Um, so if you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn um, to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4 will be in verse 6. All right. If you don't have it, it's on the, it is on the screen. But it says, do not, this is Paul writing, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, that's our key word today, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. All right, so we have a couple things going on um, in this short little two verses, okay? So it's a command. We have, do not be anxious about anything. Um, and present request to God. And we also have a promise here in verse 7 saying, The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. If we go to the next slide, um, Paul had to remind so many churches. I know a couple Sundays ago I got to preach on Ephesians, and we kind of talked about the context of Ephesus um, and remembering your first love. 
But Paul had to remind so many churches um, to be thankful. He would say it not only in Philippians, but he says it in Colossians. All over the place, Paul writes these letters to the churches. And he says, almost in every one of these opening passages of these books, he says, praise be to God, thanks be to God for what he has done in Christ Jesus. And, you know, there's a reason I think Paul has to remind us so many times to be thankful. Um, my roommate, one of my housemates, I live in Lexington, just, just off of Tate's Creek. Um, he has a dog, and his dog's name is Henry. So Henry's like, I wish I had a picture this morning. Um, but Henry is like a year and a half year old. He actually, my roommate, um, found him in an Arby's parking lot like two summers ago. And so they said, they were just getting milkshakes at Arby's and said, all right, you want to pick up this dog? And their parents were like, okay, have at it. Um, and so my friend is diabetic, and he was trying to train Henry to be able to smell blood sugar and if it would, like, fluctuate or not. So they tried to do this training on Henry, but Henry's, like, all over the place. And Elise has a friend, Hope, here this morning, and we were hanging out, um, what was it, Friday evening? And I said, you know, you got to watch out for Henry. He loves people, but he will just jump all over you. So sure enough, Hope and Elise come to the door, and here's Henry. He's like, <laughs> there's people, there's people, oh, my gosh. And so, you know, I'm like, all right, I got to release, like, the bowl. Like, come in slowly. And sure, Henry goes, oh, hey, people, oh, my gosh. You're like, you know, the zoomies. How many of you have dogs? You know, they get the zoomies, and you're just like, you kind of just sit there. You're just waiting for the tornado to end. And you have to say, Henry, off, off, off. He's like, oh, oh, oh off, Henry. And you can be like kind of firm with him, but I told Hope, I said, I usually don't get this firm with people, but I was like, Henry, off. He's like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll listen now. Um, but I, I kind of get a similar feeling from, I don't, I don't think he's that direct, but Paul over and over and over and over again, he has to say, church, thankful for what God has done. And I don't think he talks to us like dogs. He talks to us like people. But he says, be thankful in all circumstances. Be thankful and present your request to God. So if we have to be reminded so many times, that lets us know that oftentimes in our hearts, there are often things that we put up or that are based on our circumstances that we can have obstacles to gratitude. So let's look at this next slide. So, we're going to have fun this morning. we got some stick figures going on, and these stick figures represent you and I. So, if we think about God's will for us, it's to be grateful, but there are often obstacles. So, if you're taking notes this morning, we're going to have four different obstacles um, to gratitude this morning, and we're going to talk about um, how to overcome them, okay? All right, so our first obstacle to gratitude is entitlement. So, when, whenever I thought of the word entitlement, I thought of what a lot of people say about my generation. You think, oh, those young kids, you know, what do you say? They're so entitled, entitled. And that irks a lot of people, you know, because you've had to work for what you have. But entitlement, somebody who's entitled, is always thinking about the way that they process information and circumstances in their life is, I deserve blank. I deserve whatever it is. And as we can see, the focus on somebody who's entitled is on their self. And they think, okay, I'm the king. I'm, who, I'm who's in charge. Anybody, anybody know somebody who's just like, I think I'm the king and, or the queen? Some of y'all nodding your heads. It's just like, man, you're not the king. You're not the queen. And no, I'm not going to bow down to you. But one time I was preaching, it was like two years ago um, at Asbury. And this was like right before finals. And somebody had written down on like the main sidewalk of campus a bunch of like encouraging messages and something like that. It was like, you're going to do great on your finals, you're going to get an A, and you're walking down, this is like a main part of campus, 
and all the things were good. I was on the way to class one morning, and everything was good. It was like, you're going to do great. Keep it up. Don't give up. Don't drop out. You know, stuff like that. But one of the, the phrases that really caught my mind, that caught my eye, it said, choose yourself. And at a, at a first glance, that really doesn't sound something that's too, like, offensive or, like, unbiblical. But if we follow the narrative of choosing yourself, that is very dangerous. And I think, I'm not going to throw him down the drain this morning, um, but I was talking to somebody, and you know how Disney, almost every Disney movie, Disney princess movie, has something that says to the princess, follow your heart. Ariel, you need to escape this under the sea, and you need to follow your heart and find your prince. And think about this message. In the midst of everything else that was positive and that was affirming, choose yourself. It's no wonder that people in my generation and some of us in other generations can often find ourselves being entitled. Because if we choose ourselves, the end of that road is always putting everybody else's opinions and anything other that, than what makes me happy to the side, okay? Does that make sense? So that's number one, entitlement. Um, comparison, we'll go to the next slide. So, you know, have fun with the graphics. Um, comparison, the person who's always comparing themselves is always saying, I have to have what they have. Maybe it's the girlfriend, maybe it's the guy who skipped leg day, um, but I have to have what they have. And again, for some of us, um, you know, the saying, keeping up with the Joneses. I've never met the Joneses, but the Joneses apparently have everything you could ever want. They have the truck, they have the boat, they have the three, four-story house, they've got property, they've got everything. And our culture not only says, like, follow your heart, put what you want first, but it also says, you know, you have to keep up, keep up the status quo. Some, like, there's always a trend. I'm not trying to bash y'all, but Stanley Cups, that's like the status symbol of choice for anybody under, like, 30 nowadays. It's like, these are big old water bottles. You're probably going to develop arthritis by 35 because these things, de- like, they weigh like 30-something pounds. But it's like, oh, you know, it's just a glorified sippy cup. Like, okay, we get it. You still have your sippy cup. But think about that. You know, that's a silly example. But you have, like, oh, I drive an Escalade or, you know, I just have this house and You know, something that makes it a whole lot worse nowadays is this thing right here. Because some of us, like, will keep up with the Joneses all day long. Oh, look what she did this weekend. Honey, why can't we do that this weekend? Oh, man, he got a new F-150. That's too bad. Should have got a Silverado. (laughs) Oh, he, man. But we have instant access to keeping up with the Joneses. And sometimes, like, whenever I'm on social media for too long, I just get in this funk. I'm like, man, I I really wish I had this. Or I really wish I had a shorter commute. Or I really wish I could take vacations every week. And it's so easy sometimes to always keep a mindset of I have to have what they have. And for the flip side, keeping up with the, with the Smiths can keep us, like, comparing ourselves and saying, oh, the Smiths have so much less than us. You know, they, they could never afford these new shoes. So it's on either side. We can either compare ourselves and say, oh, I need this, I need this, or, well, at least I'm not as bad as that family. Y'all tracking with me this morning? So entitlement says, I'm the king. I deserve everything. Comparison says... I have to have what others have. So entitlement says, my focus is myself. And comparison says, all right, I'm going to focus on others. And we go to the next slide. Um, I I got to spend three months, um, not this past summer, but summer of 2023, in a country called Papua New Guinea. 
So Papua New Guinea um, is above Australia, and over 85% of people in Papua New Guinea live on what's called sustenance farming. So, you know, we have a lot of farms around here. We've got horses, we've got cattle, soybeans, corn, all sorts of stuff. And farmers um, usually will, like, you know, grow a bunch of acreage, and they'll sell their crop in order to make a living. But sustenance farming in Papua New Guinea is like, whatever I can grow in the backyard, that's what I'm going to eat this week. So it's back-breaking work. And nobody has, I mean, this is like third world out of third world. This is um, a time where the missionary was preaching in this village. Doesn't this just look like the chosen? I love it. It's, it's like the Sermon on the Mount. This is what I was thinking when I took this picture. Um, and see, in Papua New Guinea, um, everybody has to live on what they grow pretty much. Um, so we, we got to go, we can go to this next slide. Um, here's me and the boys. It was awesome. I spent three months there. Um, we were teaching in worship leadership and guitar stuff. And here on the right, um, we're headed to a village. We're on the back of like a Toyota Land Cruiser going like 60 miles an hour. It was awesome. I will never reach that adrenaline ever again. Um, so we're just hanging out in the back. We, we would do um, worship times together in the evenings. And we actually like translated some of their um, some of our worship songs into their language. So, um, Great Are You, Lord, like that was the one we worked on. Um, you give him life, you love, love, you bring him life, love, love, darkness. So, like, their, their language is cool. It's, it's called talk pigeon. Anyways, um, we were going to this church in this next slide, and this was like about an hour away. Can you imagine worshiping in this size of a church? I mean, this, this would barely take up, like, this section right here. And everybody's sitting on the ground. There's one light that's solar powered that they got from, like, the store, which is, like, six hours away on roads that you have to have a 4x4 four four on. And um, this weekend, we were, we were going to preach Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And I remember coming into this village and just getting to know the people, it was late afternoon, and I, these two boys were just kind of hanging out with us. They were probably like four or five or six or something like that, and I just wanted to connect with them so bad, and they, what they do is they have slingshots that they can hunt these birds with, and so even these little kids from four or five, they, like some of these kids will walk around with machetes. I mean, it's just like, that's just, just the way life is. And so I would, I would play with them and say, all right, you're the pigeon, and I'm the hunter. And they're like, oh, no. So we get to run around and shoot each other. So, um, but this one night, um, they were going to put us up. They were going to make a dinner for us. And they made these greens called kumu. And you, make, you basically put, like, ramen seasoning in, and um, they, they just grow up from their gardens. So I had almost like a love-hate relationship with kumu because it was that just every single meal. It was like collard greens, spinach type stuff. And I really wanted like rice with my kumu because that would just make so much of a difference. Um, so at the end of the service, the pastor comes up of this local church. He's like, hey, we're going to put on this big feast because the missionaries are here. Um, we're going to have a whole bunch of kumu. And it's going to taste great. And me, without thinking was like shouted out in their language, with rice. And everybody was like, all the kids were like, ha ah, you know, the white man just talked to us, like, ha, ah, great. He knows their language. Um, but the adults were kind of like, so rice, like, that costs a bunch of money for them. They would have to go like multiple hours away, and I didn't, <laughs> I didn't really think of this afterwards. It would be like saying, all right, we're all going to go to Malone's and Dean's going to pay for it, you know. That was the equivalent of what I had just asked them to do. And I remember, like, you know, I was, ha I was sitting with the youth and it was funny to them. But then when I walked out, the missionary who was preaching, he was like, and I was like, what I do? Like, we're just, I'm just hanging out with the kids. Like, we're having fun, right? He's like, 
I said, what did I do wrong? Like, we good? It's like, you know how much that rice is going to cost them, right? And it was something as simple as rice that totally just changed my perspective on how blessed we are. We can run up to Walmart and go get a pack of rice that much for like 10 bucks. I don't know how much it is. But it was just that perspective that changed me so much. If we don't have perspective of how blessed we are, we will settle for thinking that we are in charge of everything. And we will always think, oh, we need to compare ourselves to other people. That really woke me up. The next slide. So um, discontentment. This is, we talked about kind of material situations, but these are situations, these next two are situations in which we are um, looking too forward in the future or looking too forward in the past. All right. So um, with farsightedness, you're saying I can't wait until dot, dot, dot. For me right now, what I struggle with, I can't wait to be married. I can't wait to move in with the lease. That's something I struggle with being um, discontent about. Or for some of us, it's like, I can't wait until I get that new job. I can't wait until we move. And it's, I'm not saying that planning is a bad thing, but when we live our lives always thinking about, I can't wait to get to this. I can't wait to get to that event. I can't wait to go to this place. We're going to be settling, and that's going to block our ability to be grateful. And also, for some of us, it's not really like looking forward to the future, but it's saying, man, I'm like scared of what can happen in the future. So we have this, this family that the dad's thinking, all right, how can I climb this ladder? How can I continue to be um, successful? And we'll go to this next slide. Um, grief or regret. And this, this is sensitive this morning because we have, we have the holidays coming up. Um, and holidays are so tough for those who we've lost. If you're sitting at the Thanksgiving table, there, for some of us, this is going to be the first time um, that a, a spot is going to be open at that table. And I just want to acknowledge that and say that is so hard. And I don't know your specific pain, but the Lord knows your pain. And He is with you in that. And just like... I remember when my granny passed away, and it's not just a granny, it's my granny. It was like five years ago, um, in 2019, it was like October, she had a hip surgery, and it just, she never really like recovered well from that, um, but that was, that was October, and I, I spent every, every weekend with my granny and granddad growing up, when I was born in Danville, um, my granddad retired, and he moved from Texas all the way to Danville. He said, I'm done. My grandson's here. Um, and so every Friday night, we would have date night at Granny and Granddad's house. And they would get all the Legos out. They would let us watch SpongeBob, which is like a no-no in our house, make us mac and cheese, you know, take us to the park and stuff like that. So every Friday was with Granny and Granddad. And every Christmas, I remember my brother and I would run downstairs and shake every Christmas box, hoping we would get Legos inside. And Granny would just be sitting in the corner, just with the prettiest smile on her face, just happy to see your grandkids. Um, but I remember that that first Christmas was so difficult um, without my Granny. It was so hard. Um, and I have, a, I have a friend in college. Um, this was his junior year. His... Um, he lives in Colorado, so he was home for the summer, and all of a sudden, he was on the phone with his brother, and he gets a knock on the door. It's about 8 o'clock at night, and when he opened the door, there was a, a police officer standing right there, and he said, son, I'm sorry, but both your parents have passed away in a car accident. This guy's 20. I can't even imagine. Um, I, I really didn't want to like ask him about it because I don't even know how to handle that really. Somebody my age losing their parents just like that. But probably in 
September or so. He's at the Asbury Seminary now taking classes. And I said, hey, let's go get coffee. Let's catch up. And we were about to sit down for coffee. And I was like, hey, actually, there's a really good chapel speaker at Asbury today. Like, you want to go see him? He's like, yeah, sure. And I'm like, okay, this guy's going to be really good. And this guy, um, he, re- he leads like an Intercessors for America group. And I thought it was going to be like, you know, we need to pray for more revival because revival happened at Asbury and we need to do even more. But he started off his message very soberly saying, telling the story of his own experience. He said, they had hooked me up with the IV and the chemotherapy was coming in to me and it was slowly killing me but not as fast as the cancer that was inside me. And I was like, I look over to my buddy and I'm like, here goes a chapel. But that uh, whole message on suffering, um, we, we ended up getting coffee after that. And I just kind of asked him, like, dude, like, you know what suffering is. Like, you've lost your parents. And I, I didn't want to really hound you with that because so many people were, like, overwhelming him. Like, oh, my gosh, it's going to be okay. God has a plan. First of all, the best ministry you can do for someone who has that kind of loss is just sit with them and cry. But I asked him, I said, dude, how did you get through that? And he's like, honestly, Zeke, I don't think there's ever getting through that. But, you know, the, the grief comes and goes, and I don't think it'll ever disappear. And I still haven't figured out why God has this for my life. And some days I struggle to believe that he's good. I I really appreciated his honesty. I really appreciated him saying, I don't have it all figured out. And some of us this morning need, need to just have freedom to say, I don't have it all figured out. I don't know why God allowed that situation. And it would be so easy to open up a Bible and say, friend, this is why you lost your parents. But that's part of the mystery. But it's okay. But that being said, if we go to this next slide, if we let ourselves become so trapped by grief, look at the look at this root word of Latin. We're gonna do two Latin words today. I don't know Latin, but this is cool to me. So gravis or gravere is the root root word of grief in Latin, and it means to make heavy. And when you think about gravis, the first word I thought was like gravity or the grave. It's a weight. And if we go to this next slide, all of these things are earthly focus. All of these things call our attention to what we've experienced. So we go to the next slide. If we allow them, either our self-focus of being entitled or our focus on keeping up with the Joneses and comparing ourselves to other people or focusing on the future too much or focusing on the past too much can keep us in a prison of not being able to be grateful. If we go to this next slide, we think, think about Paul when he was writing to the Philippian church. He wrote this in a Roman prison, and this is just an example of a Roman prison in Philippi. He would have been like, this has been demolished a little bit, but it would have been dark, it would have been cold. All he was trying to do was preach the gospel. When we go to the next slide, I think of Paul, and I think of it would have been so easy for him to wallow in all this brokenness and all this hurt. It would have been so easy to think, you know, focus on himself and think, I'm Paul. Like, I'm I'm trying to serve Jesus. And Jesus gives me this? 
it would have been so easy for him to look at others and say, you know, all these evil people, look at them, God. They're not even living for you, but you allowed me to be in jail. Or maybe for him, it would have been easier for, to look in the past and say, you know, I, I murdered all those Christians before I was saved. Or maybe it was easy for him to look forward to the future too much and say, man, I can't just, just can't wait to get out of here. I'm just trying to get out of here, God. I really wouldn't have blamed Paul if he went super downhill during his time in prison. But Paul, next slide. Paul asked Christ in another book to 2 Corinthians. He prayed that God would take away this suffering. I want you to listen to this. He prayed that God would take away his suffering. And Christ responded to him by saying, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is perfected in weakness. So Paul writes, he says, most gladly therefore I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Go to the next slide. Therefore, I am well content. I am grateful for it. This is so countercultural, y'all. Please get this. I am grateful for weaknesses, for insults, for distress, for persecution, for difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, with Christ I am strong. There is no other message in our culture today that says, if you are weak, then you can become strong. Every other message says, follow your heart, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, suck it up, get over that loss. But something that's different about Jesus is he says, I see your pain, and you are not too broken for me to love you. Your situation is not too dark for my light to come through. And sometimes when we pray for God to take away our pain, sometimes He does. But most of the time, His Word says, for when you are weak in your pain, I am with you and you are strong. We can go to the next slide. Paul was able to say thank you God even in the midst of his circumstances. And I know he wanted to get out of there. But he was able to say, God, when I am weak, you are strongest in me. We can go to the next slide. Paul could be grateful because of his focus on God and not on his circumstances. Next slide. You know, I, I feel totally... Um, unqualified to talk about gratitude. I am not a pro when it comes to gratitude. Just because I'm up on this stage, just because I have this microphone does not mean I wake up day, every day saying, oh, thank you God, it's another beautiful day, nothing's wrong with my life. That is not what God calls us to do. But he calls us to be grateful. But again, in a couple weeks ago, I was sitting down for dinner with one of my housemates, not the Henry one. And I was just kind of processing life. Like, it's been so nice to live with these guys because all of us graduated and all of us have started new jobs and a lot of transition in the six months. Two of us got engaged. I mean, it's like boom, 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 like adult, adult, adult. I'm like 22. I'm like, where are the Legos under the Christmas tree? Like, what the heck? But I was talking, I was like, you know, like, I have to drive so far for work. And, you know, we have to pay rent, and so-and-so won't clean the, like, kitchen. And 
I was just kind of like on a pout fest. Like, oh, this is hard. I'm going through this. You know, my granddad has cancer. Like, it's just tough. And I don't know where this guy is at faith-wise. We've had a couple conversations, really. But he was like, dude, you realize what you just said? He's like, you've got a job that provides for you. Who cares if you have a 30-minute commute? Because your truck works most of the time. (laughs) Most. (laughs) He's like, you've got a church family that cares for you. And, you know, when, when I first heard him say that, I'm like, weren't you just listening to my, like, complaining dude? Like, I almost got, like, mad. It's like, who are you to tell me I'm blessed? <laughs> but what, what does the Holy Spirit do in those moments? He says, he's right. And so many of y'all have helped me and Elise And it's been an amazing six months, despite the hard, in the midst of the hard, like helping me out with my truck or putting a lease up, taking me out to go hunting, checking in on me and just calling and saying, love you, man. It took his just saying, like, dude, did you realize what you just said? And God has been working on my heart, especially this last couple weeks, to think, Instead of, next slide, I have to go to work. I have to drive 30 minutes. I have to clean the dishes. I have to see Elise, and we're both tired at night. But I saw something that really has helped me with gratitude Instead of saying, I have to, I have to, I have to, oh, this weight, that grief, that weight, that pressure, that gravity, I get to. What would it look like in your own life, whatever that situation is that comes to mind right now? Instead of, I have to, I have to, I have to, what if the Lord is inviting you to say, I get to? I get to change those dirty diapers. I haven't had to do that, thank God. I get to minister to that coworker who's difficult to talk to. I do get to go to a secular school that doesn't preach the gospel, and I do get to stand out and shine light. I don't have to. I get to. I truly believe that That principle is based upon Scripture and what Paul was telling us. It's not I have to. It's I get to. You can go to this next slide. All right, this is your second Latin word. What was the first Latin word? Y'all remember it? Gravis. All right. Gratis. It sounds very similar. All this was from a Google search. I'm not a genius. Um, Gratitude comes from the Latin word gratis, meaning thankful, thankful. Or pleasing. Think of gratitude. We can go to this next slide. Like I said earlier, Jesus doesn't always like take the suffering away. He doesn't always say there's a clean slate. But what Jesus did on the cross is he entered into our world of suffering. And he says, you're not too broken for me to be with. Your situation is not too dark for me to break through. And he says, I have come to save you. And I believe this is the key, not always praying for God to change our circumstances, but for asking him to change our perspective and saying, I don't have to, I get to. The next slide. See, Jesus enters into our suffering, and we're almost done. One of my favorite verses growing up was John 11.35. Anybody know John 11.35? It's super easy. It's Jesus wept. 
So anytime I went to a Christian school, they were like, all right, you got to write down a Bible verse. You know, this is your memory verse for the week. I'd be like, all right, John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. So easy. But in that verse, Mary and Martha will we're calling out to Jesus saying, Jesus, come quickly. Our brother Lazarus is about to die. You have to come heal him. You have to come save him. But many of us know the story. Jesus got there late. And Mary and Martha were like, what the heck, Jesus? You you let Lazarus die. But how often is our timing totally different than God's timing? He took a broken situation, and instead of just saying, all right, Lazarus, here's your ibuprofen, you're healed, you're good, he let suffering happen in order to make Jesus even more glorified, and he made the situation even better than it could have ever been had not Lazarus passed away. He rose from the dead. He said, Lazarus. Come out from the grave. And that same Jesus entered into our world of suffering. He said, you're not too dirty for me to love. You're not too broken for me to care for. Go to the next slide. Jesus turned the worst possible experience into his greatest triumph for his glory and also for our benefit. I'm going to tell one more story. I'm going to ask you a question, and then I'm going to give a challenge, and we're going to be done, okay? So next slide. I'm going to tell a little allegory between mercy and grace, okay? How many of y'all have been pulled over before? All right, we won't boo you. That's a lot of us. So, you know, like, you're driving in your car, you're probably late for something, you're speeding, you go through a red light or something like that, and then you look behind you, you see those blue lights flashing, and you're like, oh, crap, not again. You're probably late for something already, so the last thing you want to do is be stopped. So, you know, the officer, he, he comes in, he's like, roll your window down, and you're like, dang it. He's like, license of registration, please. You're like, oh, crap, I forgot my registration. I'm, I always, like, fumble around. I'm like, oh, I'm like, I'm not pulling for a gun, dude, I promise. But you give him to him, and he's like, you know what you did? And I'm like, no, it's, I didn't do nothing, you know. <laughs> this is bad. I actually got out of my last getting pulled over by saying, it was Saturday night, I was leaving Elise's apartment. I, I ran through a stop sign. It was like a rolling stop. And I'm like, Sir, I'm so sorry. I just need to get home because I need to lead worship at my church tomorrow. (laughs) It worked. (laughs) So if you ever get pulled over, say, I'm going to church. But he goes back to his car, you know. He runs my numbers. He's like, all right, you're maybe a pastor. I don't know. Comes back. He's like, all right, I'm going to let you off the hook. And this guy did leave me off the hook. He was like, all right, don't do it again. I was like, I'm going to do it again, but like, maybe you won't catch me. But sorry. Maybe I wasn't supposed to say that. Um, but that was an act of mercy for him to say, you know, you deserve this, but I'm not going to really give you what you deserve. So this is the difference. We have mercy and we also have grace. So this is grace. You know, you're, you're driving down the road, you're late for something, you're headed back to church, see the red and blue lights. You get pulled over, officer's like, license of registration, goes back, comes back. He's like, you know, you really deserve a ticket for running that red light. But I'm not going to give you the ticket. And you're like, oh, thank goodness. You know, great. And then he says something totally unexpected. He's like, you know, I also noticed that your taillight is out. So you're like, you know, you, you're probably thinking, like, you need to get that fixed. But you know what I'm going to do? I have some leftover funds from my own personal account. I'm going to buy you a new car. Can you imagine? Like, what? 
And he's like, yeah, you know, I saw like on the back of your car, you know, those little stick figures with the families on it and you got different themes and stuff. I saw you had like four kids. Like, what are you doing, dude? Like, he's like, I'm not only going to like buy you a new car, but, you know, I also have some more leftover money that you can put your kids through college with. And you're like, officer, who do you work for, you know? And he's like, you know, and I see you're probably like late to church and, you, you know, you probably give money to the church. I also have like some leftover funds to like pay off your mortgage. This is grace. Mercy is saying, I know what you deserve and I'm not going to give it to you. But grace says, I know what you deserve. I'm not going to give it to you. But on top of that, you're going to get so much more than you could ever imagine. Church, this is the story of what Jesus did for us. We can go to the next slide. He took us from our prisons of self-focus, of past focus, of future focus, of others focused. And he said, not only will I forgive you for your sins, you should have been up there. That's our speeding ticket. It's not just a ticket, it's death. We deserve death because of what we've done against God and against other people. He said, not only will I take that away from you, I'm going to give you eternal life so that you can live with me forever. Are y'all awake? This is grace. This is amazing grace. But how often do we just check the boxes? Do we just go to church? How often do I just say, oh, I have this list of complaints, God. You know, please fix my truck. Please, like, make my commute shorter. We go to the next slide. The only way out for our prisons that we put ourselves in is up by putting our focus on God and saying, God, thank you. Because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one has access to the Father except through me. Hallelujah. That I don't have to pay that price on the cross. We can go to this next slide. This church is gratitude. And I'll have the band come back up. Next slide. Here's this question. I want you to consider this. If Jesus didn't do anything else for you besides save you from your sins, would He be enough for you? I'd like to tell you this morning that my answer would always be yes. But it's not. Sometimes in my own heart, I want Jesus plus this. I want Jesus plus being married. I want Jesus plus a house. I want Jesus plus a good retirement package. I want Jesus plus whatever that is for you. And as our invitation this morning, we go to this next slide. This is what Jesus is asking. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, with gratitude, present your request to God. And the peace of God, this is our hope that the peace of God would live in us, transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Next slide. See, church, I'm not asking you to thank God just one more time before Thanksgiving happens this Thursday. But God is asking you this morning to thank Him forever. Next slide. You know, on that cross, Jesus gave it all to save us. And I'm going to give us two invitations this morning. The first, if you have your, your bulletin this morning, I want you to take the next minute or two and just think 
about what Jesus did on the cross for you, how He didn't only show you mercy, but He showed you grace. And just on your bulletin, just write a short prayer just saying, thank you, Jesus. I invite you to do that now. Find a bulletin, find a sheet of paper, even if it's your notes app. Just ask, say, Jesus, thank you for saving me. Thank you for turning my life around. Thank you for healing me. Thank you for your grace, Jesus. We'll take another minute. As you finish up those prayers, um, I'm going to give you a second invitation to use this bulletin and just for the next minute, write out anything you can think of that you want to thank God for. Remember how I talked about my friend saying, do you hear what you just said? Did you hear how blessed you were? Because I had just recited all that God had been giving to me. But sometimes we just need the awareness to think, wow, God, thank you for a bed this morning. God, thank you for allowing me to wake up. Thank you for helping me to like, have decent health this morning. Thank you for my family, my church. Just for the next minute, write, just write anything that comes to mind. And say, thank you, Jesus. for, Thank you, Jesus, for this. And I promise you, the more you build up a habit of doing this every day, saying, thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God, your perspective will set you free in Jesus' name from all the things that want to put grief or gravity on us. We're going to pray and then we're going to sing. Would you bow your heads with me? God, I just pray that You use me this morning that your Holy Spirit has not only invited us, but also challenged us to take account of how much you have given to us. Given to us. God, I pray for us this morning that we would realize how much eternal life costs. And that we would say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your mercy and thank you for your grace. God, make us more grateful people for what you have done. Continue to speak to us. Continue to move. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All my words fall short. I got nothing.
Abraham just wants to encourage us for a second. Um, go ahead. My Lord, get him. I went to a funeral yesterday. A little girl I used to go to church with, uh, Middletown, no, no Middletown Christian. That was where I was baptized. And I, I got to thinking, you know, uh, it just, when I got my cancer, my church stepped up. And Rick Ash, I want him to stand up. Rick Ash saw me at my worst time. I was down, and the chemo had got me. Oh, gosh, it, it just got a hold of me, and I was so sick. But I had to go on. And I said, if I didn't have my church family, if I didn't have any friends or nothing, I had God behind me. And I knew that. So I thank you. And he did such a good job today. It just, just touched my heart. So thank you, Z. Thanks for sharing, Pam. Um, we're going to have the elders come down, and we're going to pray um, for Kurt as he has an upcoming surgery um, this week. Um, so I invite you to come surround us as we pray um, this morning. Oh, Father, you know our hearts. You know that we live for you each and every day. We're so grateful and thankful, Lord, for you giving us the opportunity. Thank you, Lord. We know this is the season of gratitude, but Lord, you're with us every day, and we need to be grateful every day. And Father, we just thank you for this example here of this man that just lives for you and exudes that living to everyone he runs into. Thank you, Lord, for being in his life and for doing everything to glorify you. And, Father, we come today asking you to be with him as he goes throughout this surgery Tuesday and that you would guide him, give him strength and courage, Lord. Just be with him. Show him the peace that passes understanding. Father, we're so grateful and thankful for him. And we ask that you would be with him that you would lead him and guide him, and that you would give him the peace. Thank you, Lord. Heal him and give him strength and courage. Father, we take this oil and we anoint you, Kurt, in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Bless him, O oh Lord. Guide him and heal him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Thank Thank you guys for being here this morning. Um, we will see a lot of y'all back here at 5 p.m. for our Thanksgiving meal. I'm super excited for that. Um, but y'all have a good rest of your Sunday.